through 37. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. This is God's word. Okay, now I'm going to ask you to remember that parable. Okay, keep that stuck in your mind. It's a very well-known parable. All right, now then, um, supposing your memories are better than mine, you, you need to remember the parable that you heard just a few minutes ago. Now, I want to ask a question as we begin to discuss this parable. Can you tell me what it means when we use this expression, to justify yourself? When somebody tries to justify themselves, what are they doing? I would like to hear your responses. What does it mean to try to justify yourself, Rob? To give reason, okay. David? David Green? To prove that they're right. What did you say? Give reason for your actions. Yeah, very good. This is all very good. Now, there is a slight negative connotation for it, I think. Often, when a person is trying to justify themselves, tr justify themselves, it means that they're trying to show that they are not really in the wrong. They've done something, they've made a choice, and it seems like maybe they are being accused of being in the wrong, and they're trying to show that, no, they are not in the wrong, they're actually in the right, or at least not completely in the wrong. You're trying to justify yourself. Now, and it made me think that, you know, we are people who all the time want to justify ourselves. We don't like to be found to be in the wrong. We don't like to be found to have fallen short in something. And so what we do is we sort of finagle in our minds a way to explain our bad behavior and to make it seem less bad and make, our, make, our, make us feel a little bit more satisfied with our performance. And we do this when we try to justify ourselves. Now, whether it's in the eyes of other people or whether it's in our own eyes, we want to be people who qualify as good people. And so we try to justify ourselves, give reasons for why we've done what we've done so you don't think that we've done something bad or wrong. Now, the reason I bring this up is because in the parable that you just read, if you look at the context, you realize the parable was spoken because there was an expert in Jewish religious law who was trying to justify himself in front of Jesus. And that was the reason Jesus told the parable that you know is the parable of the Good Samaritan. This was a person who wanted to show himself having fully satisfied whatever demands God's law might require of him. He wanted to show that he was completely meeting those obligations. He was trying to justify himself. So it's interesting to realize that people, not just today, but people always have wanted to be justified in their own eyes and want other people to think better of them. We don't like being people who are debtors to somebody else for something we've done wrong or beggars having to beg forgiveness for having been in the wrong. We don't like that. Now, at the same time, we are told that this parable that was spoken to an expert in religious law was actually an attempt to test Jesus. Now, when you hear that, your mind might go in a number of different directions. I know where mine goes. When I think of somebody testing Jesus, here's what I think. It's another way of saying that this is a person who's trying to push Jesus into a corner and see what he's made of. Or see if he can expose Jesus as being in error. Or if he can, there it goes again. Or trying to show Jesus to be, to be, to be wrong or, or incompetent or something. 
we are not, these are not very good motives for coming to Jesus and asking a question, which was really a good question, because the question this expert in the law wanted to ask Jesus was, what must I do to inherit eternal life? But he asked that question with all kinds of messed up motivations. Now, I want you to look at the context in which this parable was spoken. Here it is. These are verses 25 through 29. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Okay? Is there any way we can do something with that door because it's going to slam again? I don't know what we can do, but it's just a big distraction. I don't know if we can put a chair out there and block it for a few minutes. The other one's not doing it. So, but we'll leave that to Gary. Okay, so picture the setting, guys. You've got, um, you've got a group of people gathered around Jesus, and Jesus is teaching them. And in the middle of this teaching session, a religious expert stands up and he wants to test Jesus. So this is what's going on here. Now, here's what it says. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? He, the expert in the law, answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. Ah, oh, you've answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And I wondered if you were reading that, what inflection would you give to that man's voice as he says this? Or what, what, I'm sorry, I am totally distracted here. I'm really struggling, but we're going to get this solved. Okay. So when this guy says to Jesus, um, what does he say to Jesus? I've lost it. I can't even understand what you're saying. <laughs> Who is my neighbor? Okay. What is his inflection? Now, I would have to say this about this context is that it's always a little surprising to me when I see Jesus turning a person to the law when that person has come to Jesus to ask him about how to inherit eternal life. This is not the only time you see this. And my mind immediately says, no, Jesus, that's not the right direction. Why are you taking him to the law if he wants to know how to have eternal life? You don't get eternal life by being a good law keeper. And then the more I think about it, if you study these situations in which these people come to Jesus and he directs them to the law, Jesus almost always uses that approach with people who already have a pretty good self-impression about their law-keeping abilities. In other words, he's recognizing a certain superficiality in the person who's asking the question, knowing that that person thinks they're a good law keeper. They're keeping the law perfectly. And so what Jesus does is he does something to drive them back to the law for another, and I would say even a deeper look. So this man is looking very superficially at the law of God, and Jesus is going to drive him back to that law for a deeper look, and which is why he tells him the parable. Now, I would say this, it's a pretty shallow person who can be confronted with the Ten Commandments and come away feeling like they performed well. But this person was one of them, and there may be those people even in the room today. And so Jesus gives us this parable. Now, before we pull apart the parable a little bit, I would tell you this, that the religious experts of Jesus' day in Judaism were very well known for majoring on external performance, doing the right things while entirely neglecting matters of the heart. And Jesus confronted them on it regularly. And these, these folks would parse the commandments of God, asking questions like, well, how far can a person walk on a Sabbath day without actually violating the commandment about Sabbath keeping? If I take this many steps, have I violated it? 
If I take this many steps, have I violated God's command about Sabbath keeping? That's the kind of question they would ask. They would ask themselves questions like this. Just how many times must I forgive a person who sinned against me before I no longer have to forgive them? What's the number? These are the kinds of questions they were constantly concerning themselves with. So do you see how these kinds of questions might be considered actually the wrong type of questions to begin with? This is what Jesus is dealing with here. These folks had millions of hair-splitting questions like this. And so it's no surprise when this expert in Jewish religious law stands up in the presence of Jesus and says, So just who is my neighbor? You seeing it? That is a lawyerish kind of a question. It is not a heart of God, kingdom of heaven value type of question. And so as a way to help this man see that he has completely failed to share the heart of God while he's been so busy scrupulously trying to parse the requirements of the rules, Jesus gives him the parable of the good Samaritan, which makes all the sense in the world when you read the parable then. So let's break down this wonderful, very well-known parable. How does it start? Well, it starts with a man, presumably Jewish, because Jesus is a Jewish man talking to Jewish people. A Jewish man heads out of Jerusalem, and he's on his way to a nearby town, which is called Jericho. And some of you are, might be familiar with the city of Jericho. It was that famous Old Testament city that had walls, and then God miraculously caused those walls to fall in. Well, the city had been rebuilt on a slightly different occasion, and it was existent in the day of Jesus, okay? And there was a traveler leaving Jerusalem, heading down to Jerusalem. Now... There are some commonalities here with Calvert County, believe it or not. You know, it's pretty hard to get out of Calvert County without using Route 4, isn't it? Have you noticed that? It's pretty difficult to do. At some point, you're going to have to access part of Route 4 to get out of the county, all right? Well, there was one road going from Jerusalem to Jericho. And travel in Jesus' day was a dangerous thing, but it wasn't because people drove too fast on Route 4. It was dangerous for another reason, and it was a very well-known fact that this particular road was a particularly dangerous road. This was a road that descended from the highest points in the region and went down, down, down through, I would call them mountain passes, if you will, sort of ravines, descending all the way down to Jericho. And it was... It was filled with places where you would be walking down the road and you would be walled in by high cliffs on either side. And of course, these, this, was, this was a perfect hideout. The rocks and, and the clefts and the crags were perfect hideouts for criminals. And there were highway bandits. And they would lurk in the higher portions, looking down upon the road that passed through where the, there were, the road was so extremely walled in, and they would watch for vulnerable passers-by to travel down the road, and when they did, they would descend upon them, and they would have a field day. And I really think that this is kind of what David, David in the Old Testament pictured in his mind when he penned the lines, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, <laughs> thou will, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. He probably envisioned something like this. Could have been this very road later. I don't know. So, this guy in the story was one of the unlucky ones. He was traveling down the road. The bandits spied him. They swept down upon him. They beat him brutally. They took from him anything of value that he had on his person. And they left him for dead on the side of the road. And you think traveling today is a problem. I've actually... You know, I had my own experience, not exactly like this, but, but, but having to alter my course because of road bandits. I was in Chad with a medical team, a bunch of doctors and nurses in Central Africa in 2006. And we were going from bush village to bush village. And we were taking, we were having to hack our way through the bush with machetes to make room for the vehicles. And the, guide who, the guy who was taking us, Samuel Dodge, 
told us later that we were seeing parts of Chad that most Chadians have never seen. And finally, when it was all over, he told us why we did that, because there were so many bandits on the roads, it was not safe to take the main road. So this is what was going on here with this traveler, and the bandits got him. So the bandits sweep upon him, they beat him, and they take everything of value that he has on his person. They leave him for dead on the side of the road. So time passes The poor man lays there. I don't know whether he's conscious or unconscious. He's probably bleeding out. He's clinging to life by a thread. And nobody comes. Now eventually, and this is the next part of the parable. Eventually in the story, after hours have passed, lo and behold, a traveler happens down the road. Another lone traveler. And it's like it's heaven sent. It's a Jewish priest. A Jewish priest who has probably just finished his week-long shift of service at the temple in Jerusalem, heading back home in Jericho. Wow, what a godsend, you would think. Now, in Judaism, the priest stood in a special position. He was anointed by God to represent God to the people. He was anointed by God to be the people's representative to God. He has a connection with God. You would think that a priest would be just the right person to be coming down the road when you find yourself in need like this man was. This guy has been engaged for the week in conducting worship for thousands of people who come to the temple every day. This is what he's been doing, leading in worship. So who could possibly represent God's compassion to this man better than a priest? But the priest, check it out, upon approaching this mass of something lying there in the middle of the road, begins to recognize that this is a person badly beat up, robbed. And he thinks to himself, "Uh uh-oh, this is not good. This poor man, look at him, what a mess, how unfortunate, what a pity. And in the story, the priest crosses to the other side of the road so as not to get too close, steps around the dying man, and continues on his journey, never even looking back. Now, if you are a little bit disturbed at the thought that that could happen, especially from a priest, then you're getting the point of Jesus in telling the story this way. One wonders how this particular aspect of the story might have affected the man who was hearing the story since he was a religious law expert. He was part of that group of the elite religious people in Judaism. So when he hears Jesus portray this priest as being so non-compassionate, uncompassionate, so cold and calloused, how is he reacting as he hears this, do you suppose? Do you think he's like shocked at the thought that a priest might ever behave so Poorly? Un, uncompassionately? Or is he getting a little bit irritated that Jesus would imply that a priest could ever behave so poorly and uncompassionately? We don't know how he's responding. We're not told. But the story isn't finished. He continues. So the crime victim continues to lay there. Hours more pass by. Now, it's high noon, and the sun is scorching. It's burning hot. Can you imagine? No help has arrived. Bugs are swarming all over his wounds. He's got animals coming up and sniffing and licking and all around. It's not pretty. Finally, another traveler appears on the road. And lo and behold, it's another religious leader. It's another Man of God. (laughs) He comes down the road. He is a Levite, we are told. Now, certainly he'll have better luck this time, right? Now, Levites, like priests in ancient Judaism, were also employed in the service of the temple. It's just that the Levites had sort of a background role. They were sort of the support staff for the priests. But either way, they spent their hours supporting worship in the temple. They were dedicated to the worship of God and temple service so that worship of God could go on there. They are religious professionals. 
what would a Leite do in the course of a day? He might teach scripture. He might lead worshipers in music. He might serve as a judge. He would certainly have oversight of the wealth. Remember all the gold and silver accoutrements for the execution of worship there in the temple? Levites took care of all of that stuff. So surely this one of God's servants would provide aid to this dying man, wouldn't he? I mean, can't we excuse the priest who was the upper echelon? Because maybe he was important and he had other things to do. Certainly this man of God will show up and do the right thing. But would you believe it? The second man of God who happens down the road did exactly the same thing as the first one had done. Upon recognizing this form on the side of the road as a human being who's injured, he crosses to the other side of the road, walks around him, heads on straight down the road, and never looks back over his shoulder even a single time. And you think, what is the world coming to? Who'd have thunk this? Now, at this point, we have to ask a question. Do you sense that there may be a point that Jesus is trying to make here by inserting two religious professionals back to back behaving so poorly when it comes to a brother in need? Do you think he may be getting at something there? Hmm. Could it be that maybe he wants to make a point about external religious ritual and its tendency to become disconnected from the rest of your life so that it never shows up toward your fellow man? I'm thinking he's probably making a point here. By now, our expert in the law, who's the target of the story, is certainly feeling a rebuke from this story. Clearly, this is no coincidence that Jesus has two Jewish religious professionals behaving so abominably in the story. Now remember that the hearer of the story, he was one of that group. But the topper has yet to come. The final nail in the coffin is about to be driven. But before we drive it in, let me remind you of something. Remember that Jewish-Samaritan relations were cold, to say the least. Samaritans and Jews hated each other bitterly. And the Jewish culture setters, trend setters, law enforcers, like this expert in the law, despise Samaritans as degenerate half breeds, apostate religious mongrels, while considering themselves the prize winning thoroughbreds. So guess what Jesus does as he continues his story? He weaves a Samaritan into it. He comes sashaying down the road, a Samaritan, a mongrel dog to a good Jew. So first, it's a Jewish priest, upper echelon. Next, it's a Jewish Levite, second tier. Now he's got the bottom rung come walking down the road. A Samaritan, a stinking Samaritan. And the guy's got to be thinking to himself, he's not going to go there. He, no, he, he's not going to go there in this story. And the answer is, yes, he is. This is precisely where Jesus goes in his story. Sure enough, it's a Samaritan coming down the road. And as the Samaritan comes upon this blood-stained pile of human flesh with torn-up Jewish attire and recognizes it for what it is, it says that he has moved with compassion. Listen to how Jesus tells it. Verses 33 through 35. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and he bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, which was all the medicine they had, really. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I'll reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Now, are you noticing a contrast? You're supposed to. What a difference between the two religious thoroughbreds and the mongrel dog Samaritan. The supposedly apostate Samaritan. Hmm. 
What a compassionate and merciful heart the Samaritan displays. Now, there's some things in the story that are easy to overlook, and I don't want you to overlook them, so I want to point them out here. First of all, the Samaritan acted in love not to his friend. I hope you're seeing that. The Samaritan acted in love towards somebody who actually hated and despised him. Do you realize that if that Jew who was victimized and laying on the road had been conscious and strong enough, he would have spit in the face of that Samaritan for even offering him a drink of water. And that's who that Samaritan stops and helps. Secondly, the Samaritan broke all the cultural rules in helping this man. Thirdly, the Samaritan spent his own time, his own personal supplies, his own money with no thought of repayment. He even left two days wages for a common laborer with the innkeeper to help continue on after spending the whole night caring for this man himself. Notice this, number four. He sought and received no notoriety or accolade for his actions. This was totally under the radar. Nobody was to know about this. And fifth, the last thing, and this is probably one of the most significant thoughts. This guy put his own life at risk to help that man. I don't know if you realize this or not, but you stop there to help that man. How do you know that that man's not a decoy and the criminals aren't still there just waiting to get you to stop? Because this is what the Chadians would do. They would put up a barrier across the road. And when you stopped at the barrier, that barrier they come out of the brush. And they said, this could very well have been a trap. Do you think that deterred this Samaritan? No, there was a job to do. There was a person there to be cared for. Now, I thought about this and I realized that you and I are probably very familiar with the reasons that the priests... I'm sorry, the priest singular and the Levite might have had for passing on by without getting involved. Because our minds work this way all the time. Maybe it was this, I'm really, really late. I'm very late. My family is awaiting at home. I haven't seen them in a week. I've been serving in Jerusalem for the week. They are expecting me. And it's not right to make them wait any longer. I mean, you, you've probably thought that before, haven't you? I'm off duty. I've been serving worshipers all week. All week. It's been a rough week. I'm off duty. I've done what I need to do here. How about this one? And this one's a little bit more sophisticated. Certainly somebody more skilled and qualified than I am for this kind of situation will surely come along. It's not like it's an untraveled road or anything. I'm not qualified for this. What if it's a trap, he could have said to himself. It's not prudent to stop here and lend help. So what I'm, my point is that we can all relate. We can all work the rationalization in our heads. We've all had these thoughts before, and I'm not, to, I'm not prepared to say that these thoughts are not legitimate thoughts. But I think that Jesus, through this parable, is calling us to a level of self evaluation. Here we go. A level of self-evaluation. I think that Jesus would want us through this parable to recognize a number of things. Here's the first one I think Jesus wants us to recognize. I think Jesus would want us to recognize, number one, that we are further from the heart of God in these matters than we would like to believe we are. Remember who he was telling the parable to as the man tried to justify himself. Okay? That's a very key point. You are further from the heart of God on these matters of mercy than you probably think you are. Second of all, Jesus would want us to recognize that we tend towards self-interest more than anything else in this life. All of those reasons were self-interest. Thirdly, Jesus would want us to recognize that there is a gap between our so-called faith or religious practice and our practice toward other people. And that gap is a problem. That gap needs to be closed. There should not be a gap between my faith and the people that surround me in my life. Fourth, 
I think Jesus would want us to recognize that we have no room to feel self-satisfied about our performance of the law. If we only saw what God sees, we'd be mortified. We are not good law keepers. We struggle to show mercy to people who speak to us harshly. We struggle with showing mercy, and Jesus is, is trying to show us this. Fifth, Jesus is trying to get us to recognize that we desperately need God's forgiveness for these failures in sharing his heart toward people. This is a problem, and here's where the gospel comes in. Jesus has died to pay for it. We just need to get past the point where we think we're good and don't need our forgiveness from him. We do. And sixth, Jesus wants us to recognize here that we need to implore God to help us get ourselves out of the way and care about others. And here's the key point. Even our worst cultural and personal enemies. There you go. That's the hardest part of the whole parable. We're not talking about people that we like. We're talking about people who can't stand us and we can't stand for various reasons. Now, as I wrap this up, I want you to notice something that's subtle in the parable. The man's question to Jesus in trying to justify himself, do you remember it? It was, who is my neighbor? Just precisely, who is my neighbor? Realize that he's trying to find a loophole. But notice how Jesus reframes the issue in verse 36. Here's what he does. Jesus says, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? Now let's rephrase what Jesus has done here. Jesus made this about neighborly action, what it is that makes me a good neighbor. Not who is my neighbor, but what makes me a good one. He totally changed the context and talked about this. Look on the screen. The issue then was turned from who is my neighbor, which is a theoretical lawyer-ish question intended to limit my responsibility. And he takes it and makes it a very practical one. How does a merciful heart behave when it is presented with an opportunity? That's where Jesus goes. And what does it say about me when I lack this kind of mercy? This is where Jesus goes. No lawyer questions here. What does a merciful heart behave like when it has an opportunity? Hmm. Great question. And what does it say about me when I lack that mercy? Because the guy who was hearing the story had no concept of the fact that he was nowhere close to the heart of God on these matters. So, guys, this is where you and I must wrestle. Who in your life is, quote, lying on the side of the road, badly beaten up and bleeding out? Does that metaphorically or even literally describe anybody that crosses your path during the week or during the month? probably more metaphorically than literally. Then the next question is, then what is the heart of God for you on such a matter? Where is the heart of mercy? That is where this parable leads us. And that is where you and I must ask God to open our eyes so we can see what he sees. The parable of the Good Samaritan. <laughs> 